Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Desrina Kong. Thank you very much for joining us today. I am the Outreach Director for the Talent Web Networking Team in SG Innovate. And uh, I'm just going to introduce our speakers for today. We have Scott Trella, co founder and uh, CEO of Novician, and Su Jia Lim, data scientist at Financial. And today's topic is leading the way how, the, how AI is disrupting the finance industry. Now, our purpose and mission, uh, the world has hard problems to solve and hard tech answers are needed. We help, help, we help scientists founders who want to solve these hard problems build companies. So we have three teams in SG Innovate. One is the venture investing team, um, the talent networking team where I come from, as well as the community and brand team. Um, so if you haven't already registered with the community and brand team, do go ahead and register with us. We do come up with quite a number of interesting events with thought leaders on a monthly basis. Today, I am going to be speaking to you about the summation program and the SaaS marketplace, uh, two of our initiatives, um, and a little bit more about the summation program. The SG Innovate Summation Program is basically an apprenticeship program that helps the students with high potential deep tech startups allowing them to gain real world experiences in areas such as AI, blockchain, cybersecurity, robotics, and quantum computing. Now, uh, why you should join us, very exciting deep tech projects, uh, not only in the facets that I just mentioned, but in a lot of other facets. Um, interesting award, uh, award and stipend starting from $3,000. Um, and you will be also attached to a mentor in the startup usually a um, the co-founder or the founder or the CTO itself. Now, um, who should join us? This program is open to local overseas students based in Singapore, as well as fresh graduates. Um, anywhere, anyone from bachelor's all the way up to PhD level, really depending on the startup and their needs. Um, someone with technical skills, so if you've got programming or deep tech knowledge, a good for you to join, or if you join hackathons, it's also good. Now, we've been seeing quite a number of alternative profiles joining us, so don't have to be a, a com science student. We have had political science students who've gone on to learn programming on their own and joining us in this uh, program as well. Uh, two of the project highlights from summation uh, by the companies that are speaking to us as well. I'm not going to touch too much in detail. I'm quite sure they will be sharing with you. But this uh, time, uh, this run, we have over 50 projects, not only in AI, but the different facets that I've mentioned. So um, I would be dropping the links in the chat later on. So go ahead and have a look at the projects that are available. Um, we are already starting to shortlist candidates. However, application is still open. It will be closing on the 19th and um, the offer would start from October onwards and you can start anytime from December to January. Each run of the program is between three to six months. Now, um, we have attracted over a thousand tech talents per run, worked with over 100 unique partners and matched over 150 talents for hiring companies. The um, the feedback from the startup owners has been really tremendously good and that has been keeping us going on and hopefully we can get more of you to join us as well. Looking at the kind of uh, talents that we attract, at least 50% are within the 70th to the 90th percentile and uh, by education level, most of the projects are looking for bachelor students, but we have been seeing um, startups looking for masters as well as PhD students. Um, looking at the kind of majors they come from, com science seems to be quite big, but we have been uh, seeing quite a number of other profiles coming in, even from business and finance and economics. Another initiative, if you are an alumni joining us and the summation program might not be very suitable, we do have a SARS marketplace, a very new initiative of ours, which we have about over 300 opportunities, full-time roles as well as internships. Um, um, as well as non-tech roles uh, within deep tech startups. So again, I will be dropping the link. Go, uh, go ahead and have a look. Even if you're not looking for a job, I think it's good just to see what's out in the market as well. Um, these are just some uh, of our portfolio companies. So if you want to find out a little bit more of the interesting technologies that we are currently working on, these companies, you can also find them on our website. So I encourage you to go and have a look at our website, find out more about these interesting deep tech uh, startups. Uh, I will be around. So if you have any questions, do feel free to direct them to me. 
Um, without further ado, I'm actually going to pass the uh, mic over to James from SMU. Thank you so much, Tazrina. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, we are, yeah, it's, it's great to collaborate with a great organization like SG Innovate. And we hope that we can continue our collaboration into the future. Uh, today, I just want to give a little plug about, uh, not me, but about the institute that I work for. Uh, so I'm sure you guys know that uh, SMU, although not the largest university in Singapore, it's, it's still a pretty big organization. And uh, so specifically, I work for the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And what we're about is about grooming changemakers. And we want to groom change makers who are innovating change as well as making change uh, through uh, their, their innovations. Uh, so how we go about doing that is uh, cultivating, coaching, and convening. Uh, on the cultivating side, uh, it's especially with a lot of young people. Uh, so I know that there are a lot of uh, SMU students who are uh, registered and in attendance for this event. Uh, so. For, for you students, some of the things that we have uh, that our institute runs, uh, we have the Global Innovation Immersion Program, which is a three month overseas uh, internship program. Uh, we have something called Protege Ventures, which is a student run uh, venture capital uh, firm. Uh, it's actually incorporated. Uh, so you're actually investing uh, real money into real companies. Um, I thought I saw a link or, or a mention about Hypotenuse. Uh, so actually Hypotenuse is a company that Protege invested in recently uh, before Hypotenuse uh, was, uh, uh, they, they invested before Hypotenuse got accepted into the Y Combinator uh, Accelerator Program, which is a really prestigious one. So good on the Protege managers for, uh, you know, betting on them. And, uh, and also at IE, we do actually have a uh, number of student clubs uh, that are under our advisement. Uh, on the coaching side, uh, we actually run a nine month, uh, four months intensive uh, incubation program at SMU, which is ac uh, industry agnostic and equity free. Uh, so we're not taking a piece of your pie like uh, some, some uh, incubators, I won't mention who. <laughs> uh, and then we also have a commercialization program which uh, helps some of our faculty or staff uh, to uh, yeah, monetize some of their ideas. Uh, and we're also a, a big convening space. Uh, so uh, my background, my virtual background is a lovely space within uh, the SMU Connection Building, which was actually supposed to be the event space for this event uh, before we need to switch to virtual. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's actually our innovation facility and event space uh, for, for those of you who are maybe holding events like SG Innovate uh, that are more on the innovation or entrepreneurship side. We'd love to collaborate with you or host you in our event space uh, so you can reach out. Uh, I will highlight lastly, just the Lee Kuan Yew Global Business Plan Competition, which runs every other year. Uh, last year, last competition that uh, ended earlier this year in March uh, actually had uh, 800 different universities participating. Uh, it's a huge competition uh, with a lot of prizes. Um, moving on, uh, just want to spotlight GII or Global Innovation Immersion again. We're actually going to have a lot of uh, uh, information sessions or different ways for you guys to find out more about the program itself. Uh, I'll also drop, drop a link in the chat box a little bit later uh, so that you guys can find out more about it. Uh, this is just a, a, a little uh kind of highlight about the six different student clubs that are under our advisement specifically. Uh, some of these students may already be uh, part of uh, these clubs, given that we advertise heavily on uh, through the clubs for this event. And yeah, and that's me and that's my email address. That's how you guys can get in touch with me if you'd like. Uh, thank you for your patience and glad you guys are, are in attendance. Uh, I'm gonna hand over the time uh, to, uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, for our next speaker. Thank you. Take it away, Scott. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Thanks, James. I teach some graduate classes at SMU and um, 
and uh, I'm also interested in your I, your sort of initiatives around change makers because that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. Let me uh, quickly introduce myself, what we're doing, and then the project that is the topic for um, the SG Innovate summation program. So my name is Scott Trelaw. I have lots of education, engineering, MBA, quant finance, even a PhD in finance at one point. Um, I'm the founder of Novicient. I've worked in investment banks and investment managers for a long time, a couple of decades. Sell side, so that's sell side and buy side. Um, just worth mentioning, there's always a lot of kind of activity around banks, um, whether it's sort of retail banks and payments or investment banks and, you know, fancy structured derivatives, but the, the buy side, investment management, you know, this is a hundred plus trillion dollar industry that impacts everybody that earns money today and wants to transform it into money into the future, um, uh, you know, for their retirement, for their family. It's a massive industry, hugely important. We think it's operating extremely poorly and we sort of want to fix it. So sort of what's unusual about me is I'm, I'm just, I guess, genetically a sort of disruptor. I, I can exist in big firms for two, three, five, eight years, but then eventually I'll kind of look at it and go, this is just not working the way it should be working. And I sort of want to get out and change it because eventually you realize, you know, often within big firms, kind of difficult to affect change. Um, so, click the right button. Uh, <coughs> Novicient, we're a five year old Singapore registered fund management firm, but we see, see ourselves as fintech operating in the industry of investment management. So we're not an investment manager per se, we're a sort of change agent. Uh, nevertheless, we do try to kind of link up to everybody, large sort of standards boards. We have a management team of seven with um, uh, experience from large firms all over the place from Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Citadel, Diamond Asia. Uh, we've raised a few million dollars in seed funding and we're setting up for a sort of proper series of funding round at the end of this year or the start of next year. What we're trying to do is to build a uh, the world's first virtual investment management platform. So what on earth is that? And the key word there is virtual. So virtual means everything is information and nothing is physical. It means we connect with our fund manager partners through APIs. Um, we're building a, an ecosystem of service providers, administrators um, that we connect with digitally. We interact with our customers, which our investors through portals and mobile apps. Um, so what we're trying to do is digitize this industry to enable it to be sort of instant, low cost and frictionless. Um, one way to think about it is we are data centric, not document centric. So all our information sits in databases, not in PDFs. What does that kind of really mean? It means, it means this, if I want to use a piece of information, say around a fee for a product, it's in a database, I can get access to it in, instantaneously. If I'm in a more traditional funds management firm, I'll ask somebody, they'll say, I'll just check my emails, can't find it in their emails, they'll, they'll call somebody, somebody will look into their emails, but two days later, the answer will come back. So, so this sort of ability to operate instant versus two days, because the information is sort of collected and virtual and available. So this is where we're sort of heading. This is, this is where we want to head. Where is the industry currently? It's still operating. So investment management is still broadly in the 20th century. That means PDFs and paper documents and spreadsheets and manual processes, essentially a very long and complex value chain between the investor and where the investor wants their money to go. So in this kind of little picture, which has been sort of adapted, um, 
the investor sees their goal of investing at the top of the hill. They don't quite realize that they have to kind of go through this valley and between the trees and catch the gondola and get on the ship and cross the bridge and go into the trough and come up the other side. And there are sort of fees and costs and time and complexity and risks, the whole path. What we want to do is sort of bypass all of that. So build a platform that allows the investors to connect directly to, to the sources of returns. So it looks broadly like this platform in the center. Um, that's us. On the left side, we have uh, investors. Um, sorry, on the left side, we have sources of return. So trading groups, fund managers. On the right side, we have investors. We kind of have portal and API connectivity. But what we're broadly trying to do is, and this is the kind of key aha movement moment, instead of money transferring around and documents being signed and what happens is everything kind of comes into our platform. So instead of us taking investor capital and sending it out to different fund managers, and we worry about that because, you know, how good are their processes? So we have to do operational due diligence on these fund managers. Then we have to check that they're reputable people. Instead, we flip the game. So instead of sending money out and contracting that way, they just send trading signals in via API. So money never leaves our platform. So all we're really doing is moving information around. They're sending us signals. We're deciding, okay, is, are there sort of alpha trading signals valuable or not? Is there sort of excess return? If there is, we can start to combine them to create customized products for investors. So all of this is sort of dynamically done, computer, algorithmically sort of driven, and nobody's moving pieces of paper around. We haven't got teams going out to, to meet the investment managers um, to see that they're, uh, you know, look at them in the eye and see that they're sort of honest. We're sort of, we're sort of digitizing the whole industry. Um, three phases to do this. First phase is infrastructure, second phase is digitizing the processes, and the third phase is the topic of this project, which is this sort of intelligent automation. Um, the infrastructure is broadly done. We've spent the last four and a half years sort of building it. So we have you know, cloud-based uh, infrastructure, processes on airflow sort of operating on scheduled and triggered basis. We have API connectivity to different fund managers. We're connecting to, to managers in Europe, US, um, here in Asia. We have investors. Um, we've got the first farm. So we are one of the sort of uh, variable capital company structure uh, recipients under the MAS for our first pure alpha fund. So the infrastructure of connecting exists and it's operating, it can always improve and we always sort of work on building a better engagement with our investors, but um, that exists. The second even harder part is now starting to what is it, digitize our operating model, which means we document every process, the inputs, the outputs, who's responsible, is it manual, or automatic, um, where, do, where do the fields that that process use link to other processes? So, so you know, for example, if I want to change one process, I want to see how it's connected to other processes so I don't sort of break everything. Um, and, you know, really from end to end, from, you know, first contact with investors to our fund manager partners to bringing on a new service provider. The whole thing is progressively being documented. And then behind that documentation is the software development. So if, <clears throat> if we think about now what is happening, we have very clear business processes linked to our software that runs the process. And if I want to change any part, it's very easy for us and the software almost easily follows. If I haven't got, we, if we haven't got this clarity and I want to change something in business because everything is always changing on the sort of business side, 
I really don't know how it connects to everything. And, and, and what I find is I change something and then errors propagate through and it becomes. So where we're trying to get to is a very dynamic way of digitally operating. So that's the second part, this sort of digitization and documentation of how we, of all our processes. The third part is the sort of exciting part. This is say sequential uh, decision analytics. So what we're trying to do, given that we know how all the processes operate and we have this sort of flow of information everywhere, now we want to be able to learn, find, optimize our decision processes, right? Because in the end, um, if we think, segue out a little bit, you know, machine learning and AI, very exciting, a lot of activity, a lot of successful proofs of concept, not so many great commercial production examples because it becomes hard, right? So there's, you know, Andrew Ng and some other, some of the sort of big names in AI are saying, yeah, actually it's kind of harder than we thought. There's less progress than we were sort of hoping, you know, artificial, you know, autonomous, semi-autonomous or autonomous cars we're supposed to be driving everywhere by now, but it turns out to be a sort of harder process than we thought. And a lot of that challenge is because the data and the processes in a, in a, in a, in a contained proof of concept space are there, but in the real world, they're everywhere. It's that idea of the fee that you need, the 20% fee that took you two days to get from the guy who had to check his emails to open up the PDF to see what the fee was. Um, just makes everything fall down. So if we can get all the data and the processes up and ready in place, then we think these are sort of necessary conditions, prerequisites essentially, to be able to do smart AI intelligent automation on top. So, so there's kind of a lot that I could talk about this, but essentially we've got a few loops around selecting managers, around allocating funds, around risk control, even on the decisions around sourcing managers and sourcing in, or, or deciding on viability of products for investors. And all of these need to be sort of smart decisions driven by state. So it essentially becomes uh, essentially a kind of big reinforcement learning challenge for, um, for what we're doing. And, 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 you know, reinforcement learning, as you guys probably know, this is this idea of, um, so AI and machine learning to, to a certain extent is, I take a lot of data, I find a model, I get some insights, and then I use the insights somehow. What we're trying to do is take the smart model driven by data, but then link it to actions. And those actions actually start to constrain and impact the future for us and our future decisions. So there's a sort of idea of trying to identify decision policies um, by understanding how, you know, today's policy will impact tomorrow's um, state and potential policies and, on, and onwards to identify sort of smart, um, a smart way to construct decision policies that are sort of optimal, that are sort of too hard for individuals or humans to really think through that capture the information that is available now in state and we expect to sort of be generating through time to build policies for how we want to operate. So we're trying to build essentially a data model driven virtual investment management firm where the humans are extracted from the process and they're sort of on top of the process. They're building the process and operating by exceptions, but they're not in the process doing the things. All of that is sort of done through our infrastructure, through our processes, uh, with a lot of the decision-making coming out of our sort of decision policies. And uh, really that is, you know, we think the future of, of investment management. And, you know, it is a, a about a million miles away from where it currently is, but we think that's a clear path to getting there. So that was kind of a lot. I'm always dumping too much information, uh, you know, pretty fast and hard, but uh, um, we have time for Q&A later. Um, uh, so let me just stop it there. 
and uh, pass on the the screen to 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 Finentia. I'll stop the share now. Um, actually, I want to just hear my contact details, but you know we're part of the summation program. This is a sort of third year through it, so uh, you can you can find me anywhere. Anyway, thank you. Sujay, you might as well start, yeah. Yep. Thanks, Scott. Uh, just give me a moment, I'll share my screen. Okay, all right. Thanks everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, thanks, Scott, for the engaging um, presentation on your company. All right, so um, I'm Sutie. I'm basically the data scientist at Financial, and I'm leading the data team in Financial, building um, basically better financial um, services for the unbanked and underbanked population in, I would say, the emerging markets in Southeast Asia. So prior to this, I was actually a data scientist at Vulcan AI, which is an agri-tech startup um, where we built computer vision solutions uh, for the agriculture industry. So analyzing of satellite images and mobile images uh, using computer vision models. Okay, so maybe a bit more on like what Financial is. So basically what we do is that we are building an open finance platform where we are really building the underlying infrastructure to help um, enable better financial access for people in across Southeast Asia, right? Um, if you think about it, we are like the SG Findex, um, but with more functions across like Southeast Asia. Right? So I'll go a bit more into that later on. Okay, so maybe to take a step back, right? we think about like why we are actually doing this and what is the problem that we are trying to solve um, in the emerging markets. I think one of the main reasons is because we see a lot of uh, underserved needs in Southeast Asia. And for example, right, if we talk about payments and transfers, if we think about Singapore's context, you no know, transferring money to people um, using pay now or using like um, fast transfer is instantaneous and it's also free right but in countries like indonesia you actually have to um, pay to actually make transfers and um, sometimes if you're only transferring a small amount of money right the amount that the fees that you pay actually take up like maybe one two percent of what you want to transfer which is quite a lot for especially for the emerging markets where people don't really make um, that much money for quite a sizable um, proportion of the population. I think the other one is on credit. So in developing countries like uh, Indonesia, you it's not as easy to get credit, access to credit, unlike in um, Singapore, you know, where you can get, just get a credit card if you want. You can just apply for it through some online means, right? But in Indonesia, you don't really get that. And a lot of this is because you um, a lot of this population is unbanked, meaning they don't really have a bank account. So you don't know the history of the transactions that were made by this person. So then since there's no information, I'm not going to take that risk and um, give them access to credit. Right? So that's the main uh, needs that we are trying to serve with financial as an open finance platform. Okay. Some of the constraints that we see in the market that we are trying to address is um, to provide these services, right? Like payments and also credit and also savings accounts. There are a lot of steps that are actually involved before we can actually provide that to the consumers, right? So one of the most basic ones is KYC, know your customer. So before you can onboard a new customer um, onto your platform, you actually have to verify that this customer is actually who he claims to be. Right, he isn't doing any like um, sort of money laundering with the account, and his background is clean, and he's not using, he's not doing any identity fraud and using somebody else's identity um, to create a bank account for himself. Right, so that's one. Um, the other one is on distribution. 
So how do we actually reach out to these consumers? Because it's not like a small market in Singapore, right? Where you know, um, distance is not really an issue, but in a country like Indonesia or even like Philippines and Vietnam, right? Where the geographic distance is quite a huge challenge. Right, even though we are really moving more towards like um, digital platforms, but still distribution is a challenge sometimes. Right, for example, if you want to actually borrow money, right, some of the credit companies actually require you to be there um, so that they can see you face to face before they actually distribute the loan for you. Right, so these are some of the constraints that we are trying to solve with the open finance platform that um, we are building at Financier. Yeah, and the other challenge that we see is that um, a lot of these consumers are blocked off from new services because of the fact that even though they are really very plugged into the digital ecosystem, their data are actually sitting um, siloed in various organizations. Like for example, you have information about your bank account with the bank you shop on um, platforms like Shopee but this is with Shopee or you have information um, about your telco bills and your utility bills right but this all belong to the individual organization right they don't actually communicate with each other so let's say you have to go to the bank and then ask to borrow say a million dollar rupiah Right. the bank will look at your bank account and say that oh yeah i only know like how much you are spending for say the last three months because that's how long you had the bank account with us but actually you could have have like multiple bank accounts that you don't really use sorry that is more of like your primary bank account and this bank is something that you don't really use that often or it could be that you actually have other digital footprints with e-commerce like telcos and uh, utility companies that we could have gotten more comprehensive information about you if only these organizations will actually share data with each other right so that's where financial comes in to actually provide that platform for these organizations to actually share that so that we can actually solve this problem of having data being in um, different silo databases, right? So that we can actually provide better financial services for consumers and also better financial access to, um, for example, credit for these people. And one of the, some of the benefits of liberating consumers data from this so-called silos of databases, right? Is that, you know, by liberating this data, we can actually get more comprehensive information about these customers, even though they might not be, for example, a customer of the bank or a customer of like Shopee, but by pulling all the information together, we get a better view of the customer. And how we are doing this is basically we are doing it through an open API platform where data partners can join onto our platform and provide information about um, consumers. They can also be a client on our platform to grab information with consent, of course, about, other, uh, about the customer from other platforms so that um, it's much more convenient for them to integrate this data into their existing processes. And they can also customize it such that they don't have to build all this uh, infrastructure on their own. They can actually tap onto what is already there on financial platform to then um, both be compliant as well as to use the information to good use um, to provide better financial access for the unbanked and underbanked population. Okay. And I think the long-term goal of what we are trying to do at Financial, right, is basically not just to provide better financial access to people, but also give consumers the control of their data. Right? So consumers can choose whether they want to share data across organizations, 
rather than um, at the moment, it's more of like organizations having the control and access to this information and choosing like whether they want to um, work with other organizations or not, right? So now um, the long-term goal of Financial is actually to give consumers back the control rather than put it with the organization itself. And I think for financial institutions and also for other fintech players, what we are doing is we are really um, automating and making it easier for them to integrate some of these basic services that are required, like for example, KYC, so that they don't have to build this um, basic infrastructure. They can continue to work on the product that they are actually offering to their clients rather than um, to spend time and engineering effort to build these basic uh, services which don't really value add to their product, but it's actually a requirement to have it um, as part of the regulation. And for today, what we see is that open banking is gaining traction, especially in Southeast Asia. I mean, in Singapore, we have the SG Findex where, you know, in the past, if you have five different bank accounts, you need to create a spreadsheet and then um, pull data from each of these bank accounts so that you know overall what's your portfolio size, right? But with SG Findex today, what you can do is simply by authorizing um, SG Findex and using your MyInfo to do it, you can actually, on a single platform, know how much money you have in all five of your bank accounts, right? So that's something that we are trying to do with Financier. And beyond that, besides just aggregating information of the consumer what we are also going to do is that um, besides the basic kyc verification and also um, getting a better view of how you're spending your money where you're spending your money in the future right it could also be providing better financial access right let's say if i see that you are making a million rupiah a month right then you have a very good record. I can even offer you um, working capital loans or productivity loan that is perhaps 20 to 30% of your monthly income so that it can actually help to improve your own uh, financial access. And what you can do with the credit is um, unimaginable, right? In Indonesia itself, um, we also see a payment infrastructure like BIFAS and in Philippines also, they are actually adopting um, so-called open finance framework to actually do more of like open banking in Southeast Asia. Um, so we actually do see this whole movement of open banking and open finance in particular, um, gaining more traction across like in this region or in this part of the world. Okay. Uh, and maybe just to share a bit about the project that um, you guys will be working on if you were to join us is that uh, I think maybe to call it a project is sort of like an understatement because what we are really building is more of like a data product. So you will be involved with um, building of the innovative credit scoring from end to end, meaning from sourcing of the data to improve the existing model to then deploying this model um, for our clients to actually use it, right? So a lot of times when you work on project, it's more of like, okay, I use data science to build some, um, to improve the existing model, but you don't really get to experience the whole end-to-end -end process, which is from data sourcing to building the model to deploying it and then um, to actually see your customer use it and give you feedback on how it's actually working. But at Financial, you will be able to experience all that. Okay, and I think, um, yeah, so here is um, our website. And also if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, you can also drop me an email. Thank you, Scott and Su Chie. Uh, we have about 
20 minutes left for questions. I, I'm just going to quickly share my screen because uh, we did receive uh, three questions from you guys. And I do understand that we have a couple of questions coming in as well. Uh, maybe for a start, this is for Sichia. What is the job scope of a data scientist? Okay, all right. So I think um, typically what you think of a data scientist is that, okay, I get some data, I build a model, and then um, probably that's maybe the end of the life cycle of your job scope. But I would say that, um, especially if you're working in a startup, the job scope will not just be on building of models, but also on sourcing of the data, what kind of data is useful for your model, and then how do you actually um, reach out to potential data partners to get that, and then putting it into your model, improving the model and enhancing it. And then after that, you also need to deploy it, right? So it, you have a model that's working, but you also need to deploy it so that the user or the client can actually use it. Right. So it's from, I'd say in summary, it's like from data sourcing to modeling and then to deployment. Okay, interesting. Um, maybe before going on to the second question, the third question is a bit more relevant uh, for you and Sichet. What sort of skill sets, tools are needed to join the industry as a fresh graduate? I, I think in terms of like, tools, um, basic programming knowledge will be very important. So because a lot of the work that you will be doing involves like, um, I think nowadays the popular framework is Python, but um, who knows, it may not be the popular one five years down the road. But for now, I think Python is quite um, widely used in data science industry. In terms of skill sets, I would say that um, being open to learn and be motivated to keep learning new things, especially in the ICT industry where things are changing very rapidly. So what is relevant today may not be relevant uh, one, two years down the road. Okay, so what you mean is continuous education, just to keep up uh, to know what the industry is uh, requiring out of you as well. Yeah. Would you then say that uh, certifications would, uh, would also be encouraged from your perspective? I'll say that certifications are uh, a good way to show that you have some basic skills. Of course, it's um, I it's better if you have like hands-on experience working on projects rather than um, to showcase like oh I have five different certificates right. But if you have a project or portfolio to show, I think that really speaks volume about what you know how to do and what you can do. Yeah, and I think that's how internships uh, do help the students as well. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Scott, this is more for you. How has AI been changing the fund management team and its impact? And what are some AI-related roles in the finance industry? Okay, so, um, I mean, I think as soon as you think funds management, people think trading and then they think, can we use AI to find strategies that generate excess return? So anytime when people come and join the VCN, they sort of are doing their roles and then they sort of seem to kind of have this idea. I've just got this thought, this idea that well, I think if we did this trading strategy, maybe it'd work and we could make excess returns. And that turns out to be quite, <clears throat> quite hard. So you have kind of big sophisticated groups um, with a lot of infrastructure, lots of sources of data, building strategies. So AI can help there. And AI is useful because it helps you combine different types of information. So I can have inf you know, unstructured information. So historically, at least on the sort of trading side, um, uh, uh, sort of asset management or sophisticated trading strategies have been developed really with statistical, you know, approaches. 
based on structured data. So data you can pull out of Bloomberg that exists in tables, whereas AI can now start to be a bit smarter and start to do a bit of work with sentiment and different data sets, satellite images and stuff like that. So it's kind of got that um, um, focus there in the higher frequency trading, reinforcement learning and some other tools are kind of picked up to, to do some very fast, um, slightly smarter trading. <coughs> Um, but I think, you know, the bigger opportunity is just in a broad business sense. And it's sort of what we're doing, which is why I'm saying it, which is how do we make better business decisions given the information that we have? And the information can kind of come in in sort of table form and, and different data structure form. And how do we build models that sort of, pick up this information and learn and just make better decisions progressively through time. And then, you know, the, the sort of interesting focus, I think if you're sort of thinking about an area to work on is, is working on machine learning where there is a time dimension, right? So historically, AI and machine learning is kind of static. It says, give me a ton of data. I'm gonna find a neural net that matches, that fits this input data to this set of labels. And then, uh, I've got some insights. Instead, we want to start to operationalize that and say so we've got data sort of feeding in. We want to have a, a model that is learning and, and starting to feed out decisions and those decisions kind of feed back and I can sort of improve the model and, and do things a little better than that. So, so it's historically been in this sort of harder edge trading spaces, but I think it's progressively starting to shift towards how do I run our business kind of better, at least in funds management. Still a long way to go. So it's speed and uh, do, you do you foresee that the AI roles are also going to be changing along the way, evolving in that sense? Mm. <clears throat> so again, sort of machine learning AI, again, neural nets, that deep learning thing is, it is got a you know, certain level of interest, but even the sort of those those big names behind deep learning are saying you know maybe we have to go a little further and where i think where we think they need to go is a more dynamic sequential way of operating so information comes in maybe i update my models i make some predictions i learn if my predictions are good and then new information comes in so this kind of moving through time right because we all exist in time um, we don't exist one off so there's always new information coming in so this and reinforcement learning has been sort of one way to do it but essentially I think you know the, the interesting thing coming up is how do we how do we better integrate information and then decisions and then updating models and then new information and decisions and updating models how do we sort of start to integrate it into our actual production processes and start to move AI ML away from just sort of generating insights to, to become physically part of improving whatever process we're, we're operating on. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Scott. Uh, maybe we will go to the first question that came in from Arvin. Um, he said, thanks for the detailed presentation, Scott. I might be oversimplifying things, but it appears that you're building a solution that would displace traditional fund administrators. Mm. How far have you gotten in teaching the platform to manage the process of different fund management product classes? So we want to bypass kind of both of those a little bit. Administrators, we're fine. They're partners. We can work with them if they have a solution, that's fine. What we are really trying to bypass is, is most of the funds management industry, which is a lot of marketing and distribution. So investors, kind of have to trek through it to figure out where they should put their money. What we want to see is really um, a, a more objective machine driven way of operating. And in particular, the industry to an extent has been very product push. It creates a lot of products and it just tries to sell them. And it makes money by selling more products. So it's kind of driven by AUM. What investors need is not product, what investors need are solutions. They have 
future consumption targets, wealth goals, things that they need to have happen in their lives. And you need to interact with these with people to understand their needs and to con dynamically construct solutions that meet their needs. They don't really need another product solved them. They need a solution that fits what they require. The industry is all about selling products. So, so by bringing things online and having information streams feed in, it puts, um, it gives us the ability to select, allocate, and dynamically create and customize solutions. So we're trying to shift from a sort of product push to a solution driven industry. And because it's technology, it's not a solution only for pension funds with a hundred billion, it's a solution at increasingly granular scale. Why, why can't we provide customized solutions for somebody with a thousand dollars instead of instead of uh, $10 billion? So we'll work with partners like administrators. It's really that <clears throat> the marketing and, and sort of fund houses that we're looking to sort of um, bypass. So uh, to simplify things, I would say, you know, you're not displacing traditional fund administ administrators, but rather you are helping them in their, in their, in their role. Mm. With, with so technology is coming in to help them, right? Um, next question again for you, uh, Scott, what is the next strategy for growth uh, for Navicent? So we're focused on emerging managers, hedge funds to generate sort of alpha solutions for investors. But um, now we're going to, we'll start to extend to sort of a broader set of products, low any products, factor products, essentially to be able to fully span, um, in other words, create solutions for the full set of needs for investors, rather than just a sort of, a sort of um, alpha or sort of excess return need that we've started with. So we've started with the hardest part, but the next step is to, to broaden the sort of input streams to allow us to give um, a broader set of customized solutions for investors. Thank you, uh, Scott. Um, let's move on to Su Chia. Um, so hi, it's, it's coming from Arrow. Um, hi, Su Chia. Apart from uh, credit scoring, what kind of problem in Financia that you think data science can solve? And are you planning to do that in the near future? Yeah, so I think um, besides credit scoring, right, we are also building data products for things like income verification. How do we ensure that the income specified by a consumer is what it claims to be. And also, um, besides that, we are also looking at how do we um, classify risk of the consumer beyond just like a credit score, but also a more detailed breakdown of um, different areas of the consumer's behavior, right? Um, from financial data to non-financial data to um, data sources like telco, utilities, so that we can have a more comprehensive view of the consumer rather than just looking at the consumer as a, as a credit score, right? If you get a credit score of 800, um, what does it really mean, right? It's an easy way to summarize your credit worthiness, but is this really the true picture of how credit worthy you are. Okay, we do have some questions coming in about the program, so I'll leave it to uh, one of my colleagues to answer about the summation program. They will uh, reply you directly. Um, I'm a bit worried about time. We're left at five minutes. So we will go on to the question by Fergus. Um, I'll be directed to Suchet. In using AI to drive decisions for financial inclusion, how do you ensure bias is removed from the models? Right, so I think um, especially for um, financial related models, right? It's important for us to have the ability to actually dissect what is predicted by the model and not just take it um, as it is. So whenever we have any credit scoring, we want to know what are the factors or what are the features that are actually contributing to a high or low credit score and whether we can actually explain that, um, whether it makes logical sense for us, even as a human, right? Thank you, 
thank you, Scott. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in again. Um, sorry, thank you, Sir Chair. Um, Scott, this is for you. Hi, Scott. Uh, it's from Andrew Vidono. Hi, Scott. Hope you're well. How is the vision different from a platform like Fun Supermarket? Mm. Now, so a platform is one of those words that gets used everywhere. So a, a fun supermarket is really like a matching thing, right? You, you, how do I find a fund that's suitable for me? But it doesn't really do that much beyond that. We are transforming how the industry operates. So it's no longer uh, help me find the fund and then I still have to do everything that is the same. We're trying to build a sort of seamless end-to-end -end solution so investors can kind of come in and get a customized solution that they need. Um, and that's all they sort of have to do. So it's a bit, I mean, you know, we try to think of analogies to try to communicate a little better. You know, you could go to a, a computer store and buy a kind of computer off the shelf that they're selling, or you can sort of perhaps go to Dell and say, this is what I need. This is a solution that I need. And behind the scenes, Dell will kind of put everything together and, and give it to you in a fairly seamless and easy way. So, you know, they will actually construct the computer. We will construct the solution. Fun supermarkets, I think those types of platforms are a little bit more of a, a matching service where you just, it's really, search you know how do i find something that matches what i need that's that's different we are we are we are the production process um with a particularly a different way of working with the sources of returns right we don't as we say we don't take capital and give it out to them because then we'd have to do our own due diligence on 20 50 100 managers instead they're sending their trading strategies into us so bits and bytes information streams so we strip out the whole, you know, this operating due diligence uh, problem is a 6, 12, 18, 24 months and very expensive process for investors to get comfortable putting their money out to, to lots of managers. We can sort of remove all of that. And now we can also start to deal with strategies quickly, right? If a strategy is doing something wrong or, you know, moving outside of what we expected it to do, you know, within minutes we can shut it down. If you're a traditional investor, you find out because they give you a piece of paper at the end of the month saying, you know, your, your strategy lost 12%. And you say, well, you know, now you tell me, <laughs> why didn't you tell me when it lost 3% and I could have done something. So trying to move the whole industry on line, you know, we, 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 you know, it's like the matrix, right? Information is just sort of flowing around and we just collating it and diverting it and constructing it. We, we're trying to remove the whole physical slow, costly, you know, inefficient part of everything out. Thanks for that, Scott. Um, last question, uh, last two questions we do have. Uh, it's already eight o'clock, so uh, I'm sorry, but uh, if you can just spend us, uh, spare us another five minutes for the last two questions, it would be great. Um, Scott, uh, um, because we didn't really get to hear too much about the summation project, uh, if you can just share with us a little bit about the summation project. Um, as part of the program, what can the students look forward to learning? What kind of skills are you looking for as well? So we're Python shop as well. Um, uh, we, are, we are looking... So we feel like we're always kind of at the bleeding edge. So we don't, you know, we sort of have to develop people internally um, because they just sort of don't mostly exist. But people who are, we, we're not expecting kind of that low level, you know, Linux uh, operating level. We're also not expecting, you know, data analysts who can run some statistics. We want people who can kind of build software you know, that can, you know, some object-oriented approaches that can, you know, understand the concept of, say, building state and working with databases and updating and feeding back and linking to, you know, we've got web portals and things like that. Um, so um, it is kind of harder core machine learning, reinforcement learning AI, um, so not, but not 
you know, not a not a not a, a, a Ukrainian, um, uh, you know, low level software person because we already have that. That's our CTO. Um, it, it's somebody in the middle that that can sort of link what we're trying to do in terms of this vision about updating and modeling and building sort of robust code that can actually implement um, and work. So that's, yeah, very fluffy, but um, that's it. Maybe you can also share a little bit of what kind of skills do you, you know, require from the person who's going to be joining? Mm. Um, Python, a bit of software development, you know, you're familiar with Git, kind of GitHub, maybe Jira, you know, that would sort of integrate into us, you know, um, no SQL and sort of SQL databases. Maybe you're a little bit familiar with sort of um, some Bayesian type statistics and approaches. Um, I mean, all of that is kind of, you know, if we're a bit missing, you know, we'll, we can help you and teach you. Great. Uh, we'll go to the last question. It's actually for the both of you. So maybe Sucha will go first. Um, it's from Financial Diageo Rojas. Um, why did you guys decide to begin your career in uh, data or financial services and what inspires you? Yeah, I think for me, um, it's always been, uh, I felt that I was good with numbers and I wanted to do something um, that was technical and interesting. So that's why I got into data. And I think why financial services is, I think financial services has the potential to change people's lives, right? Especially with the financial inclusion that we are trying to advocate at Financial. Thanks, Richard. And yeah, so kind of technical data driven, you know, uh, sort of solutions should be sort of computational algorithmic rather than remove humans. So it's kind of a natural way of thinking, kind of skepticism about human decision making. Um, uh, you know, good in some areas, often not good in many areas. Uh, and financial services, I just sort of got into that, right, sort of post MBA, um, ended up in a bank. And, but the more, you know, and it's an investment banking, that was kind of a dysfunctional place because, because it is. But then one of my professors said, listen, the, the problem is not so much there. The problem is on the buy side where, you know, everybody has a, an enormous amount of money exposed to very inefficient and suboptimal processes. And I guess it suggests sort of credit as well as you know, lending as well as sort of investing. Um, and even worse, if, particularly in funds management, it is an industry that almost disregards the customer. The customer is a resource. How do I get fees from my customer? Not how do I really deliver performance for my customer? It is, it is just an industry crying out for some fundamental change. Um, and so that's me. <laughs> I'm the change agent. Wish you all the luck, Scott. I'm sure you are going to be a change agent. Um, we have come to the end of uh, the program. Again, once again, I want to thank uh, Scott uh, and Sucha as well as James for this collaboration. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, good luck with, uh, with both of your organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you.